The Earthly Powers Podcast, Part 4 Norman Douglas, The Anti Toomey Throughout Earthly Powers, Kenneth Toomey frequently mentions the Anglo Austrian writer Norman Douglas. Douglas, most famous for his novel South Wind, is variously described by Toomey as filthy, an omnifutuant, and nicknamed Ab Norman Fuckless. But who was Norman Douglas, and why did Burgess choose him to be Toomey's nemesis? In this episode of the Earthly Powers podcast, we speak to Rachel Hope Cleaves about her new book about Douglas, Unspeakable, A Life Beyond Sexual Morality. Rachel is a professor of history at the University of Victoria in British Columbia, Canada. She specialises in the history of sexuality. Along with her book about Norman Douglas, she has written about same-sex marriage in early America and is currently working on a historian's guide to food and sex. A word of warning. This episode of the podcast contains some frank discussion about the abuse of children. Thanks for joining me on the the Burgess Foundation podcast, Rachel. Uh, I really want to talk about your book, which uh, I found really, really nourishing read in ways that I didn't expect that I would. Um, but the the subject matter is is complicated and very very tough in some places. Uh, what what made you want to write about Norman Douglas? It actually all began with a <laughs> with a vacation and some lighthearted reading. So in uh, 2013-2014, I was spending a sabbatical year in Paris uh, with my family, and we were looking for an inexpensive spring break vacation, and there were some cut-rate air tickets to Naples, you know, Paris to Naples for 50 euros or whatever it was. And so we bought tickets, uh, and a friend of mine said, oh, you know, while you're in Naples, you ought to go to Capri. I knew nothing about it, but I said, sure, that sounds great. And because I'm a nerd, I'm a history professor, so of course I'm a nerd, I started looking up, you know, historic books about uh, Capri so I could learn more about the island. And I read this novel, South Wind by Norman Douglas, and I was fascinated by it because I'm a historian of sexuality. And Douglas's novel depicts a the sort of cosmopolitan expatriate society in Capri. Uh, at the turn of the 20th century as being like really sexually diverse. You know, there's characters in the novel who are gay. There's characters in the novel who are nudists. There's characters in the novel who are adulterous. There's characters who are uh, cultists. And I became fascinated by this portrait he'd drawn of turn of the century, Capri. So following my interest in the novel, I thought, "Mm, I'd love to learn more about, um, from a nonfiction perspective about what life was like on the island at the turn of the century. This is, of course, many people have been fascinated by this time and place. And so I tracked down Douglas's autobiography, Looking Back, published in the early 1930s. And I'm a well-trained historian, and I was told, you know, as a graduate student, never to take a memoir at its word. Of course, people are writing from the uh, you know vantage point of the future. They they obfuscate various truths. They make things up. I knew that, but nonetheless, I had gotten Douglas's memoir, thinking here I'm going to find the real truth about um, what Capri was like in uh, at the turn of the 20th century. And as I was reading the memoir, which I was completely consumed by, and it's a I think it's actually a brilliantly written book. Um, I didn't learn that much about Capri, but I was shocked to discover that Douglas wrote uh, very openly about various times throughout his life that he had purchased children for sex from their parents. I thought to myself, like, how in the world could somebody write so openly, publish so openly about this in, you know, 1933, right? Like, when I tell you, this is not a a 17th century book. (laughs) This is a mid 20th century um, memoir. And he was a public figure. Um, And so I was so surprised that the uh, norms of the time would allow him to write so openly that publishers would go ahead and publish it, that it could be reviewed well. Um, And 
And I realized that although I considered myself to be an expert in the history of sexuality, I really did not know a lot about the history of uh, intergenerational sex or sex between adults and children, um, which is both are challenging terms because by the standards of our own time, there is of course no possibility for sex between adults and children. We refer to uh, these sort of encounters as rape. But that being said, I didn't know much about the history of this topic. And I realized that there just hadn't been that much written about it. And so I was curious, I was still reluctant to get into this project. Um, but I, I kept sort of following my interest in Douglas nonetheless, while I was working on other things. And I ended up at the archives of the New York Public Library, where in their Berg collection, which is a collection of sort of um, archival materials related to authors, I came across uh, Douglas's or diaries of Douglas's travels, mostly during the 1930s, that were originally written by his friend, uh, the publisher Pino Orioli, and then transcribed, typed up by Douglas. And these diaries were incredibly explicit about Douglas and to some extent Orioli's sexual encounters with children during their, their travels in the 30s. And it was when I came across those uh, uh, diaries that I realized that um, this was a project I had to do, that this was a really unique source that was open about the um, nature of this, what was, of course, a completely disreputable and often, depending on time and place, illegal sexual practice. This was a source that was extremely open about it. And I thought would really add to um, historians' understandings of what um, 20th century sexuality was about. So that's why I wrote the project. It, I found these sources and I thought I have to share these with a broader audience. They can't just be um, you know, manuscripts tucked away. At that point, there wasn't, they weren't even, um, you, you, you wouldn't even know they were in the New York Public Library unless you got into this room and went through the card catalog. They weren't even findable online through a catalog. Were these diaries known about um, before uh, you uh, found them or, or were they written about before? They were known about. Um, so, and they had been written about once at least, which was how I found them. Um, and so for several years, there has been a project, I think it's just recently completed, uh, going on that's been funded by the, um, the state library of Freiburg, the Austrian estate that, um, where Douglas was born and spent uh, much of his childhood. So for... Uh, for for many years, there's been a project by the state library there to um, uh, collect his works, hold symposiums on his on Douglas's works, and um, otherwise um, historicize his life and 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 bibliography. And so, in one of the collections produced by this um, like biannual symposium that was held by the state library in Vorarlberg, there was an essay that made reference to the, these diaries. So I knew, that's how I knew the diaries existed before I went looking for them was from the footnotes. It obviously, um, it was not a source that was widely read. I don't know how many people, it, it's a fairly obscure publication. You know, people don't tend to read symposium proceedings uh, in large numbers. So it had been written about in this, you know, pamphlet that has probably been written by, read by a handful of people. Uh, also, I mean, there is a major biography of Douglas that came out in 1976, which I think we'll talk about later in the conversation by Mark Holloway. And Holloway had read the diaries. And I write in my book actually about the very interesting correspondence between Holloway uh, and the archivist at the New York Public Library at the time in the um, early 70s when he was trying to read the diaries. And um, Douglas's literary executor at that point, who was still alive, um, Ken McPherson. So uh, Ken McPherson tried to keep the diaries under wraps, but he was persuaded um, by Holloway and by the archivist at the New York Public Library to allow Holloway to read 
the um, the diary. So Holloway had read them, um, but he didn't really incorporate them uh, into the biography, um, and certainly um, he didn't go into depth about their contents. So I think because what they reveal about Douglas is really so unpleasant. <laughs> So while, while Holloway is honest about Douglas being a uh, pederast, he doesn't, he's not interested in digging into the depths of, you know, his sexual behavior, I would say, in the way that I was interested in. But reading your, your book, the, the idea of, of having to sort of trawl through, through some of, some quite unsavory writing is, is not something that, that uh, I would, I would relish myself, but but in your book, you never go so far as to call Douglas a monster, um, despite uncovering all of these horrendous and criminal acts that he he perpetrated. Um, why not? Why why not call him a monster? Well, to my mind, that what I see as monster discourse, this labeling of um, men who have sex with children as monsters, is really a means of exculpating. Um, you know, the rest of society. So I don't think, um, you know, monsters are not people, right? Monsters stand outside of society. That's what makes them monsters. And I think we as, um, you know, rational people are reluctant to believe in monsters, that monsters walk among us. But the more I studied the history of um, intergenerational sex or cross, you know, sex between adults and children, the more I realized, first of all, how common it's been throughout time, and it continues to be extremely common today. Um, and second of all, um, how, how many uh, social structures were established um, to, to make it possible, right? So like when Douglas is um, traveling uh, with Pino Morelli through Italy as, you know, and, and other places as described in his diaries, and they are picking up children for sex. They're not acting outside of society. Like they're facilitated by uh, innkeepers who are setting them up and other procurers. You know, these kids are um, engaging in like well-established um, practices of sex tourism uh, with other adults who are, you know, approaching them for um, paid sexual encounters. So what I saw in the sources, and it wasn't just in Italy in the 1930s, but I mean, Douglas, who was born in 1868, he lives until 1952, throughout his entire life, you know, he goes to a lot of places where there are established um, uh, uh, markets in child prostitution. I mean, and that ranges from... Uh, you know, Naples at the turn of the century where he lives or um, St. Petersburg uh, in the 1890s where he serves as a diplomat or London in the um, 1890s and early 20th century where uh, he lives at various times. Um, this uh, includes, um, you know, trips, uh, many trips abroad, especially to North Africa, Tunisia. Also, he goes to you know, India and um, what was at that time Ceylon, Sri Lanka. So, I mean, he travels throughout the world and encounters, um, you know, established practices of uh, child prostitution and um, sex tourism in all these places. He's not operating as a man outside of society. He's not a monster in the shadows who's like grabbing, uh, you know, kids off the street. He is a customer in... Um, a child sex trade that is extremely common. Um, and so, and like I said, I mean, my sense is that, you know, as, you know, as taboo as it is to us, the truth is that sex between ad adults and children remains extremely common today. And I wonder whose purposes are served by seeing and it's mostly men. Uh, I think women are rarely customers in this trade. So that's why I uh, focus my attention on, on men. You know, whose purposes does it serve to refer to all these uh, men who engage in this practice as monsters? I think what it really does is, you know, um, 
let the rest of us off the hook for what's actually a, a social and sexual order, which permits and allows for this sort of behavior. So I personally think that um, uh, sex between adults and children has been common throughout time and it's common today and we need to be honest about it and it will serve the purposes of um, the empowerment of children and the um, you know, protection of children from exploitation and violence more if we uh, talk openly and honestly about the nature of these relations and if we pretend that this is something that doesn't happen and it's only, you know, this handful of boogeymen who we can expose and uh, drive out from society and then the problem is somehow resolved. I, I think uh, that's what makes your book so good really is that you paint norman douglas as a human being uh which is kind of more terrifying than than just sort of dismissing him um but at the same time as as, as that you you never go so far as to excuse or or euphemize his behavior which i think is is a really important distinction to make do you think the other writing about Douglas has sort of romanticized his lifestyle? Well, I think there's been a mix of approaches on Douglas. So he has always had his defenders and his romanticizers, and that does remain the case through today. And he's always had his harshest critics who see him as a child eating ogre. Um, there's always been a mix of approaches. It has been interesting to me in researching this project, uh, you know, to encounter people who, and I won't name names, but people who like, I knew they knew exactly what Douglas was up to because they had read the sources and yet, um, and yet they loved him so much as a writer um, and as a character that they were unable to acknowledge what they knew about him. So it wasn't, you know, their romanticization of him wasn't through ignorance. It was like they could read the sources where he writes and here I'll uh, be, you know, explicit uh, for a moment, but the sources are explicit that Douglas, um, you know, sought sex, uh, anal sex, both on the recipient and the uh, penetrative end with children, oral sex, both recipient and, you know, as a giver and, uh, all manual sex and all other forms of sexual encounters with children as young as at least 10. And there are sources where he's, you know, erotic writes about or other people write about him um, uh, touching, you know, children as young as seven. So I'm not, the, it, Douglas is not somebody who um, lusted after older teens necessarily, but uh, children as young as, as seven years old, uh, both boys and girls, but uh, primarily boys. Um, and so it, you know, I have uh, had conversations with people who love his uh, writing or love his character so much that even though they know this to be the case about him, they at the same time just cannot believe it to be true of him. Um, and so they tell themselves and this comes up a lot in the sources that, well, you know, it was just touching or it was harmless touching. And he he loved the children so much and they loved him. And, you know, he, he it was ultimately um, none of the children were harmed from, you know, they all got more than uh, was taken away from them uh, through these interactions. Um, and, I, you know, I I. Don't so much, um, I'm not interested in like castigating people who um, turn a blind eye to the actual uh, nature of Douglas's sexual encounters with children as much as I'm really interested as a historian of sexuality, how we engage in these forms of uh, what anthropologists have called like active not knowing. And I think it's something we do in all sorts of circumstances about all sorts of uh, sexual behaviors that uh, and other um, misdeeds that we um, disapprove of right uh, among our family members or community members or whatever we engage in these forms of active not knowing um, in order to preserve 
um, the order as it stands, right? So like, you know, I'm sure that uh, many people listening to this podcast know that they have family members or people in their society, in their communities who are doing things they should not be doing, things that are wrong and things that are bad. And um, rather than calling out the people they love for doing things that are wrong or bad, you know, sometimes they just engage in not knowing what they know about those people. That, that's really interesting. It's uh, uh, and, and very relevant, I think, on a, on a sort of bigger scale. Uh, today where where the sort of people that we have voted into high office and that sort of thing both in america and and the uk are are both uh sort of imperfect people that that a lot of people actively sort of uh ignore the the worst sorts of behavior um but in in terms of of douglas and his his him being a sort of literary superstar essentially in his day um do you see any connections with other literary figures from around that time such as uh one that's relevant to earthly powers uh somerset Maugham? well so douglas was very much at the center of british literary circles in the 19 teens 1920s and 1930s um and he knew mom Pretty well. Um, mom, according to some stories, mom helped support Douglas financially throughout much of his latter life. Douglas was always, you know, scratching for pennies. He had lost all his wealth as a young man. He's born into this wealthy family, but um, he, he loses it all. Um, and he survived by selling the copyrights of his books and selling kind of collector's editions of his books and fostering a um, collector's market for his books, but he also survived off the generosity of wealthy friends like uh, the poet and writer Breyer um, and, um, you know, Mom and others. Uh, so he knows Mom well, and Mom definitely um, shares his predilection for male youth. Um, I'm not sure if Mom's predilection for male youth extended quite as young as uh, Douglas is, or I think Mom might have been more inclined towards older teenagers. They're not uh, intimate friends, but they are travelers in the same circles. And then, I mean, Douglas just knew you know, so many people in the literary circles of the day. He's discovered by Joseph Conrad, who is a close friend of his for many years until ultimately Douglas's 1916 arrest um, leads to a break between him and Conrad. Conrad knew perfectly well about Douglas's uh, sexual behavior prior to 1916. It doesn't come as a surprise at all to Conrad. He's just done with uh, Douglas at that point. Um, obviously, Douglas had this sort of on again, off again intimacy with D.H. Lawrence. They get in big fights, they make it up. Um, and he was friends, quite good friends with Aldous Huxley, who he sees frequently in Lawrence in the uh, 1920s. Um, he was very close uh, for a while with Compton Mackenzie, and then is close for years after with um, uh, Compton's wife, Faith Mackenzie. He knew Ford Maddox Ford, you know, uh, like I said, Breyer, um, HD, uh, you know, all sorts of, like a lot of writers over the years. At the end of his life, he's very close friends with Graham Greene. So he traveled in many literary circles and he, a lot of his uh, literary friends uh, were gay. Um, some were gay women, some were gay men, some were pederasts. Um, and, you know, many of his literary friends were not. He, he had a very wide circle of, of uh, writer friends. Many of the names you, you mentioned there were, were sort of key influences on Burgess, the people that came before Burgess. So Aldous Huxley, uh, Joseph Conrad, mm -hmm. all, the, all these people were, were very much part of Burgess's literary foundation, really. Um, Norman Douglas doesn't seem to to apply in that way, um, but suddenly Burgess 
decides to write about Norman Douglas in Earthly Powers. Um, what, why do you think Burgess chose Douglas to be the villain of Earthly Powers? He's, he's not actually, he doesn't appear as a character in the book, um, but he's often referred to as, as Toomey's nemesis. That's such a good question. And it's a question I had, of course, as I, as I was reading the book prior to our conversation. Um, so I, I suspect a lot of it has to do, of course, with the 1976 publication of this biography of Douglas by uh, Mark Holloway, which, you know, which he read and, um, and reviewed in, um, in, in TLS. Holloway, like I said, although he doesn't write extensively about uh, the diaries that inspired me ultimately to write my book, he is clear that Douglas had um, a series of sexual relations with mostly boys throughout his lifetime. And it's a really, um, the biography is quite, um, was it's groundbreaking? People knew already, and uh, Richard Aldington had published this, uh, you know, scathing attack on Douglas in 1954 called uh, Peterman, um, where he also accused Douglas of uh, overtly of being a, a pederast. I suspect Burgess, having uh, read Holloway's book, which is so comprehensive and so clear about Douglas's. Um, uh, sexual practices ended up finding Douglas to be like the perfect foil in earthly powers for, you know, the worst, um, what Toomey sees and maybe Burgess saw, I don't know enough about Burgess to know that, um, as like the worst iteration of same sex sexual encounters between males. So in some ways I feel like there's these, you know, there's at least three different models for like how to be, a queer man in the world in earthly powers. And one of them is Toomey himself, who, um, you know, is never at peace with his own sexuality and, um, you know, is closeted for most of his life and is often, um, you know, resisting having, um, you know, is often lonely, is often not um, uh, with a lover. And then his, um, you know, the relationships he does have are often unhappy, right? Like they're, um, his happiest relationship, I, if I'm reading the book right, is, un, is, is an a asexual relationship. It's a platonic relationship, you know, and then his sexual relationships are mostly exploitative. <laughs> He's getting exploited or there's some like, you know, there's some cross currents of exploitation. But I mean, I think that, you know, that vision of, um, you know, a, a person who, you know, Toomey is a gay man who's, he knows he's a gay man, he's open to himself, but he's never a really able to be open and to find a loving relationship. Um, and, you know, at the other extreme is, um, you know, Val Wrigley, who I think represents for, you know, more of the, uh, an open, um, an early open homosexual voice, right? Who is more comfortable being who he is. Um, and along with, you know, writing less popular, uh, <laughs> uh, a poetry than, um, you know, then, and then Toomey's very popular career. So you have, uh, Val Wrigley, who I think kind of stands for this new way of being gay in the world that, that emerges in the 20th century, um, that uh, grows out of the homosexual rights movement, which you know Wrigley is part of, right? And Wrigley uh, testifies in the Well of Loneliness, or case, or if he does, maybe doesn't testify. Now, he he goes and protests at the very least, right? When uh, Toomey refuses to, and then on the other, I think you know the other pole is represented by Douglas, who um, there's no. Uh, political content, there's no love in, uh, he just represents for Toomey, I think, the sort of basest um, sexual uh, hedonism of um, male same-sex relations, which, you know, in Douglas's case are uh, primarily pederastic, right, which the sort of homosexual rights movement in the 20th century is, of course, differentiating the key to the movement is that it differentiates 
consensual same-sex relations between uh, adults from this uh, pederastic intergenerational model that uh, was, you know, is was common throughout the 19th century. And as Burgess suggests throughout his book, you know, does continue to be common in the 20th century. So I think that, you know, there these different characters represent like different ways to be kind of queer men in the world. And Douglas represents, you know, the worst uh, a potential vision of that life for a Toomey and I assume for Burgess as well. Maybe you can't answer this question, but do you think there's evidence in the novel that, that Toomey worries that he could quite easily become a, a Norman Douglas type? bigger oh sure i mean and don't you think the opening sentence you know where he says like i was in bed with my catamite i mean that that's like that i i mean i find this book fascinating and i'm i'm really interested to you know know what you think having uh studied it way more intensively than i have obviously but um yeah i do i think that um that that possibility in some ways um maybe Burgess's vision is not that different from mine that um you know Douglas isn't necessarily a monster he represents a potential that is widespread and quite common and Toomey might see him as as a as a true monster but he's also you know but but like as I said when you asked me about why I chose not to treat Douglas as a monster. And I said, because I think it's about like morally exculpating the rest of us. Like we live in a society where like sex is often structured as unequal, where children are often eroticized. Like it lets us all off the hook to kind of pretend that it's only these handful of monsters who engage in intergenerational sex. In some ways, I think uh, Toomey, by seeing Douglas as such a monster, can let himself off, off the hook and sort of suppress you know, his own, um, uh, you know, desires, erotic desires for uh, youth or to engage in sort of this uh, no hold, no holds barred uh, lip, libidinousness, libidinous behavior. I think that's right. And I, I think, um, you know, the, the book essentially is about the evil that human beings can can uh can do and I, i'm thinking in, in particular of the scene where toomey visits the concentration camp that mm -hmm. the way that's written is is all about this is mm -hmm. human evil it's not about gods and it's not about the devil it's it's about what human beings can do to each other and i think that that's the sort of bit where toomey loses his innocence so in in a way his his view of norman douglas keys into that theme of the novel um of a, a, a sort of human being doing doing evil um yeah and and i i do think also that that toomey uh succumbs to to his temptations uh it, it there's a scene in italy where he goes to the doctor because he has what he describes as spermateria and mm -hmm. um, the doctor suggests that the only cure for this is that he immediately has to go out and have sex. And he he meets a boy on the street and it's implied quite heavily, I think, that it is a pederastic, uh, a, a pederastic relationship that he has with this, this Italian boy on the street. And I, I wonder if mm -hmm. that that's to me sort of in the throes of this sort of madness because he's denied himself so much. He sort of turns into Norman Douglas at, at that point in the novel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's always looming inside him, and and I think uh, Burgess is suggesting that in a less homophobic world, where Toomey was would have been able to uh, be more at peace with his love for uh, men, that he wouldn't have, uh, you know, felt that sort of. Uh, uh, you know, need to have sex with boys, although it doesn't do much for explaining uh, Douglas, who doesn't, you know, neither in um, Burgess's representation of Douglas nor in, uh, you know, Douglas's representation of himself. It, you know, Douglas isn't 
having sex with boys because he's not able to, you know, admit to his own uh, love for men. I mean, he, he, you know, Douglas is, was in his lifetime completely unapologetic about his desire for boys and to some extent girls. So his desire for children and youth. Uh, he didn't, he, he didn't live in the closet about, <laughs> about his desires and he didn't apologize for them. Yeah, I, I mean, Burgess, uh, in all of his writing, is quite strange about sex, really, or whether that's homosexual sex or or heterosexual sex. He, it, it's never particularly a, a joyful thing, or or something that that is ever really fulfilled, in a way. It's always mm-hmm. sort of cut off before before he can get his pleasure, really something happens Mm -hmm. it's always a very anxiety inducing thing and I wonder if if Burgess's own experiences in his early life might have have had something to do with that I mean we don't really know the story he talks in his autobiography about being deflowered by an older woman but but whether or not that was an abusive relationship um we we don't know but but it's sort of speculation I guess but um He's so he writes about sex in such a sort of neurotic way that that and that that comes over in Earthly Powers, I think. But uh, in in terms of of Douglas in the novel, uh, he appears by name. But are there any episodes in the narrative that that you think Burgess got from, particularly the Holloway? I think because I think that's probably his source for most of the Douglas stuff in the novel. Um, do you think there's there's incidents that happen to Toomey or happen around Toomey that that could be inspired by by Douglas? I'm not sure. Do you have something in mind? I was thinking about this. I I was I I was wondering about the Arthur Curry um episode where they go to Nice and meet some oh, sailors. Oh oh yeah, and, and and well, so Curry is depicted as like in a Douglasian. Um, encounter isn't he because he he said he likens him to douglas in that scene where he sees him having sex with that's right yeah passed out sailor outside the outside the bar yeah i think it it, he he, he's going at it in the norman douglas style i think in in the the, norman douglas style yeah you know um so douglas boasted sexually a lot and um he and i think you know many of his boasts were probably true and others were probably not who knows um but he liked to shock people and so he told he was a a a raconteur you know he was a storyteller um he repeated himself that my my sense is like that's where a lot of the stories and looking back come out of from things he had repeatedly told people to amuse them by shocking them with his um you know uche sexual behavior so one of his boasts whether or not it's true is that um, in 1917, he's in France and he is going to see his uh, son Archie in a field hospital after he's been gassed um, in, in a battle. And along the way to the field hospital, uh, Douglas comes across a soldier from Madagascar, dead drunk, dead drunk in a ditch, and he buggers him while, this is his words, not mine, you know, while he is um, passed out and, you know, and the, the humor is like he he'll never know he was, you know, buggered by the, the great author of South Wind. So I'm sure that many people listening to the story don't find it funny at all. Uh, humor is, you know, one of these one of these great windows into history because things that were funny to some people at some times are no longer funny to us. And so Douglas tells this as a funny story. Um, most people hearing it would probably think it's a horrifying story. Um, and so that episode outside the bar in Nice, where Curry is having sex, you know, raping this sailor who's totally passed out, right, is um, does remind me of that Douglas boast. But, I mean, let's be honest, like, I don't think, um, uh, you know, raping passed out people is something that was, you know, exclusive to Douglas. So the fact that it 
evokes this boast by Douglas does not mean it was based on Douglas. Unfortunately, you know, uh, sexual violence against incapacitated people is common. It happens all the time. Um, and it is, suggests that again, that, um, you know, sexual exploitation and sexual violence are, are pretty common in uh, history and in the present. Uh, whether or not it was inspired by Douglas, I think uh, Burgess definitely doesn't play it for laughs. Really, I think Toomey's horror is is real on the page. It's, yeah. it, you know, it's uh, it's quite a, a a grueling scene, really, to read. It's not a knockabout farce or anything like that. Um, but th- this sort of brings me to my to my next question: is uh, Burgess throughout his his writing he had a a history of calling out child abusers um i'm thinking particularly of douglas in earthly powers but also um jimmy savile who he he doesn't mention by name are you familiar with this story i am i am and i yes um so in in his autobiography he doesn't mention jimmy savile by name but he he mentions the dj with the blonde hair that has a, a love of the young and is disgusted by this man. And, and it's quite clear who he's talking about. And there's another place where he talks about Savile going around in his sinister shower bank, picking up children and that sort of thing. Um, and this was written in the, in the late eighties. So way before. Long before um, he's exposed. Exactly. So I was just uh, wanting to ask how how rare was it for a person of Burgess's generation to be that that engaged in um the idea of abuse of children or or um you know the that those sorts of sexual misdeeds yeah i think i think it's fascinating that Burgess called out Savile so um early although not by name like you said um and thinking about the Savile story reminds me of um you know, that Justin Theroux documentary after, I don't know if you saw it, like after uh, Louis the Savile. Louis Theroux, was it? Oh, sorry, Louis Theroux. Tom yeah. Theroux. Um, <laughs> too many Theroux. The Louis Theroux, after um, Savile was exposed, then he has this like apologetic documentary where, because he had previously done work about Savile. That's right, yeah. Right, and then it's like the post-expose documentary where he says like I it was right in front of my eyes and I couldn't look at it um and so I think like uh Louis Theroux was engaged in that um that form of active not knowing that we were talking about before like he was watching Savile perform all these acts of um uh you know uh sexual predation in front of his eyes and just didn't didn't see it wouldn't see it couldn't see it, couldn't make himself acknowledge it um and so i think you know i don't think that burgess is alone in calling out uh child abusers like i said i mean douglas always had critics during his lifetime as well and certainly immediately after his death i mean aldington is just scathing um in peter man there's nothing you know, there, there, there's no redeeming point <laughs> to his portrait of Douglas. And I think back, you know, to, um, you know, earlier examples. And of course, you know, sex scandals and the calling out of sexual misdeeds have a, a very long history. Uh, and take, for example, like there really are no age of consent laws in uh, British law into the mid 19th century. Um, until you know at some um level they emerge out of this uh a series of exposés written by William Stead right in the 1870s um that give all you know tell these um terrible tales of the um you know uh the the white slave trade and the the, the capturing of uh, English uh, uh, innocent English children and their sale into brothels on the continent and all the rest. So, I mean, people um, call and 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 it's that um, expose, you know, which leads really to um, the uh, 
the creation of age of consent laws in part. So I think that um, there have always been voices calling out perceptions of um, child exploitation and uh, child sexual abuse. And, and those, you know, those sort of panics over child abuse have been put to various purposes, you know, not necessarily, they haven't always necessarily served the interests of children and youth, I think, um, but have been um, deployed to achieve various ends. Um, so I don't think Burgess is alone. Um, yeah, I think he represents a, a, a set of voices that, um, that were deeply, re you know, repelled, upset um, by what they saw uh, as uh, ongoing child abuse around them. Thank you, Rachel, for joining us on the on the Burgess Foundation podcast, and and best of luck with the the book and uh, your your future writing, which I, I look forward to reading. Thanks so much for having me and uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about Douglas and learn more about Burgess. I really enjoyed it. Rachel Hope Cleaves' book, Unspeakable, A Life Beyond Sexual Morality, is out now from Chicago University Press. The Earthly Powers podcast is produced by the International Anthony Burgess Foundation, for more information on Earthly Powers and Anthony Burgess, visit www.anthonyburgess.org. <laughs>